great honor to be talking to you and, and get some experience from you. Well, a piece of your huge experience in the fly fishing world. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I've been faking it the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> too modest. Too <laughs> modest. So I just I just bought your book. Awesome. Good. Yeah. So I was I was looking into it and uh, well I'll have to study it because yeah. in Brazil uh, uh, bass has been introduced in some regions. Sure. I have tried it, but I got my ass kicked. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's a totally different species. I mean, it's a, it has wow. to be it has to be looked at as a completely different species. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it was like five years ago that I tried it. It wasn't a lagoon. It's a lagoon, the place that there's there's okay. the smallmouth. Yeah. And uh, I went with a friend that has a boat there by the lagoon, yeah. and he he's a bait fisherman. So he was using the Texas rig, all those kinds of rigs. I don't sure. know the names. Yeah. But um, I went with floating intermediate sinking slow mm -hmm. fast all kinds of retrieves that i knew back then right and and eventually i got one little one but it <laughs> was because i was practicing uh spay casting and casted like 50 100 i don't know 200 casts right. at the same spot <laughs> and eventually by luck a miracle he got into it so i was like yeah my first bass but you know no technique well, at all. It's it's a lot easier here in the states. It's a lot easier here in the states. I mean, we're well, we're we're blessed with just some incredible, you know, largemouth bass fishing. But like our smallmouth fishing, and especially where I am located in the United States, um, we are kind of in like the holy grail of the best smallmouth bass fishing. And one of the coolest parts is lagoons, lakes. Uh, a lot of our lakes up north have high populations of smallmouth bass. But what's awesome about the smallmouth that we pursue and that our guides pursue is that they're river fish. You know, All right. And, and that's a completely different game because, like, the river fish are a million times stronger than our lake run fish or our lake fish because they're born kind of on a treadmill. You know, they're fighting the current their whole lives. So, All right. Muscles but, build up. That's it. But it was right. such a cool thing because you and I, I, I had the pleasure and the opportunity to fish with you on the Marine. It's a great honor. Great it, honor. Well, it was a blast, man. Well, we caught a yeah. double of two gigantic. Yes. A big yes. And, uh, uh, one of the most iconic memories I have from that <laughs> river. Yeah. It was, it was yeah, epic. Buddy. Yeah, it was but epic. The, um, but I look back on like my transition of getting to do some of the adventure travel and then moving into like some of the peacock bass stuff. And I started fishing peacock bass at like Agua Boa Lodge and got to right. travel and fished by you guys. And I've gotten to fish peacock all over the jungle. And I love peacock bass because there was a lot of resemblance between smallmouth okay. fishing and peacock bass fishing. So. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, so let's just go back a little bit. Yeah. And why don't you give us a little bit of feedback on a background really about you. Okay. When when did you start fly fishing? Was it with your father, uncle? Who influenced you into the sport? How did you get to know the sport? Or sure. was it by yourself? How did you get into it? That's a, that's a great question because most people that get into the sport of fly fishing have a mentor of some sort. You know, like right. you said, a grandfather or a father or a brother that taught them. But really, I, I kind of just taught myself. It was my cousin Bart who guides with me still today this one awesome. of he's our head guide in the shop but he and i are only a year and a half apart in age so we kind of grew up doing outdoor stuff together that was our program and i really didn't start fly fishing at first i started tying flies so when i was probably nine or ten years old my dad had an old kit to, to learn right. how to tie flies so it really started from me just attaching feathers onto a hook and not knowing what the hell I was doing, it had nothing right. to do with, with, with anything. So I was just lashing stuff on a hook. And uh, we would go up to my grandmother's cabin and we would just go try to catch whatever with what we made. So that was kind of the beginnings of like my fishing career. So it started tying before I right. started fly fishing. Where was that? Where was that? The city, the location? Sure. Uh, well, I'm from Green Bay, Wisconsin is where we are. Like my, my, right. my hometown is Green Bay, Wisconsin. 
and uh, we'd fish some of the rivers in northern Wisconsin for trout. That was primarily trout. what we would fish for was trout or tried to catch trout. Yep. All right. Rainbows, browns, both brook trout. What was uh, ra rainbows and brook trout? Or I'm sorry, browns and brook trout primarily. Browns and a handful of rainbows, but mostly brook trout uh, was our most common fish. Brook trout and brown trout. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. So, but yeah, so I, I started doing that and uh, uh, just kind of fell in love with the sport of fly fishing, like a lot of people like yourself and a lot of the guides that I've had the pleasure of fishing around the world with. And uh, it just escalated and just kept growing. And um, I guided in Montana. I worked for Wild Trout Outfitters and I guided on the Madison and the Gallatin Rivers out there. And I met my wife there and we opened our fly fishing store. Let me let me jump nope. right in. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. When did you make that transition to Montana? When did you oh. click? I'm going to work with this or, you know, it might be a long story, but I want to hear it because okay. it's, 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 it's an interesting step that I, I understand that a good part of the audience wants to know about. How did you well, jump into the industry of fly fishing? That's a really good question because I'll give you kind of the, the, the truer story or the deeper story. All right. So, everybody dreams about turning like their hobby or their passion into like their career, their career path. I just wanted to fish. You know I mean? I, 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 did, I didn't, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I was just going to fish like crazy. Yeah. So um, I had worked uh, with some friends and um, you know, my parents basically said I, I didn't go to college. I didn't, I didn't get a degree. I didn't do any of that because I was too busy fishing And um, I finally had a job in a bank. So if you can imagine, I was a banker. Right. How, yeah. how old were you back then? Um, at I'm that 40, age? I'm 47 now. So I was probably early 20s. Early you know, 20s. Like early 20s, working in a bank. And I realized that, like, I've always been an outdoors person. I realized really quickly yeah. that a suit and tie was not going to work for me. So I remember distinctly, I went into our banking officer's office and I told her, I said, I'm leaving. And she said, well, you're leaving. What, where, when are you, uh, when are you, are you giving your two weeks notice? I said, nope, I'm leaving right now. And I went to my house, my apartment, and I packed up my truck with really no plan at all. And I put everything that I owned into that little truck and I drove to Montana, not knowing Were you still living with your parents back then or just ready, uh, living by yourself? I was, I, was, I was actually living with my brother, Tommy, at that time. All right. so I was living with my brother. So I picked up stakes and I drove to Montana. And um, I Did you had a plan? Did you contact anybody before? Or just let's, yeah. I'm going to hit it. I'm going to do it. I, 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 I made it put some feelers out, but it was just like I was sitting in my office one day. I was like, this sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. And, and, and that's what happened. So I yeah. went out there. To the horrible disappointment, I'm, I'm super lucky because I have a very close-knit family unit. My mom, my dad, brothers and sisters are That's awesome. a big part of my life. And uh, I remember how disappointed my folks were, my parents. I understand. That, I understand yeah. that because yeah. uh, stability, bank, you're going to abandon it all. What you going right. to do? You're going to be right. fishing? Something like that, right? Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. at that point, I didn't even think of a career. I'm just like, I, I don't know. I'll just catch right. a bunch of trout. <laughs> um, yeah. but, uh, so, so I, I, I moved out there and I was really lucky because I met a guy, his name is JD Bingman. He's one of the craziest guys ever. He's, he might be watching tonight, but JD owns oh, cool. wild trout outfitters. And I, I got a job at this ranch where I could wash dishes or, you know, sling beers in the bar or whatever, just so I could fish And JD Bingman. Uh, at Wild Trout said he, they had a pond there and they had a little fly shop and he saw me casting on the pond and he said, hey, uh, do you want to teach casting lessons at the That's ranch awesome. here for the guests? That's awesome. So fast forward, um, I started teaching casting lessons and he said, uh, do you want to do some trips for me? Well, at that time, I didn't have two nickels to rub together. I mean, I was broke. Broke. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And uh, he said he would give me the key to his fly shop at night and I would tie flies for him 
to pay for my guide's license and my credentials and everything that I needed. So like to this day, I owe JD a great, a great deal. So that's, that's awesome. Kind of, man. Yeah. That's kind of how it started. So I lived out there and I met my wife, Sarah there. And she was uh, like, I don't know, she was like 19, you know, we were, we were kids and yep. um, she, uh, you know, we fell in love and, I came back here because in the winter I had an opportunity to own or to run a snowboarding shop. All right. So, yeah. So uh, uh, some, some of our friends. So I ran their snowboard shop and started their snowboard shop for, her. and then my dreams of like, how do I turn this into a career? Like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and Sarah and I started talking about opening the fly fishing store. And in 2001, we opened tight lines fly fishing company 2001 yes that's sir. awesome yeah that's been awesome a long time. 19 years mm -hmm. awesome man congratulations that's that's Thank great you. that's just great yeah Thank you. so so at that time did you when you opened the fly shop did yep. you went back and forth to montana still no nope that was the decision yeah that was that was the Based decision wisconsin and and run yep. the shop and there then Sarah moved the here. The ramifications. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Sarah moved here and finished her education here. And uh, we decided to open the fly shop. So I would guide full, I would guide through the shop. And uh, we re we did a business plan and kind of figured it out. And um, we just kind of winged it. But the hardest part of the story, Rod, is my family, you know, when I came back, they're like, a fly fishing store. And you have to, you have to understand um, yes. Cult culturally in like the United States, like Western part of the United States is the fly fishing Mecca. It's Montana. It's Colorado. It's, you know, uh -huh. it's all of the big states for fly fishing. And uh, Wisconsin is not. In fact, in the state of Wisconsin, there are still only seven fly fishing only stores in our state. That's it. The whole in state. The entire state. Where Montana has, I think it's like 1,250 wow. or something. So it's, it's, it's small. Yeah. So my, my parents, looking back on it, were terrified for us. Like, what? this is a horrible idea. And uh, they were going to have an intervention, which is pretty funny, because they were going to assemble and somebody was going to talk to me about what a terrible <laughs> idea this was. Tried to convince you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, crazy yeah so, so, so yeah. We, we, we always joke at family functions because they'll see stuff on instagram or on facebook or anything of, of me in some weird place somewhere in the world and they're like no shit look at that he he's, <laughs> he, he, pulled <laughs> he pulled it off <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome so so that's the story that's kind of how it all yeah. how it all began that's that's awesome. Um, being, I imagine uh, you have to have courage. You gotta have trust in your gut. Yeah. Uh, be humble. Yes. To get jobs that yes you don't want to do it, but you have to do it to get where you want to yeah. be. And that that's that's to a point that uh, maybe some of the audience will relate to this. Uh, maybe uh, a lot of the youngest people, I, I mm -hmm. believe, want too fast, oh, want too quick. Yeah. Our, our, our world doesn't work like that, Rod. I mean, yeah. at, like, at a high level, it doesn't work like that. And in fact, you know, we see a lot of, um, you know, just the presence on social media and some of that stuff, everything has to happen so quickly. And, yeah. and to be honest, respect, and I'm a lot older than you are, and I'm a lot older than a lot of the viewers and a lot older than people that are watching tonight. Yeah. But um, it comes from time. It comes from experience. It doesn't matter how much you know in a short period of time. It just matters how much you've accrued knowledge from other people. And I think that that's the key. You know, it takes time to get to where. And a lot of work. A lot yeah, of work. A absolutely. lot of work. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, anything that you would like to add up to uh, maybe someone who's enthusiastic about 
go into the guide business or even some sort of ramification of on the entrepreneur entrepreneurship part of fly fishing industry itself like yeah what advice would you give yeah i mean like just just advice is what we've talked about like yeah i mean number one you have to stay stay the course i mean you have to you have to have a focus you have to become really good at your craft and it doesn't mean copying other people doing their thing it means finding what you can do finding a niche that is you um it, it, the truth is like i guide for trout we fish all over the world for salt for i mean the, the, yeah. jungle fish all over the world stuff like that but like i'm not a master of all of this stuff i'm great at smallmouth angling and gu and guiding because of the amount of experience that i have so i guess uh it, what you want to do is get as much experience as you can in a, in a specific area and focus on that don't copy somebody else do it on your own you know i mean i think that's the big thing and like you said not so fast like slow and steady Patience. Yeah. Instagram and Facebook is not about bragging and pounding your chest about like who you are and how great you are. It's about like a community, not tribalism, like really, really yeah. do the thing. That's awesome. That's, That's awesome. all I got. Yeah. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for the insights. Yeah. So from 2001 to 2009, 20 right yeah. now, uh, You've built the shop, you, you've grown it, yeah. and things escalated. You've built the, the guiding business and also hosted trips to other countries. Yeah. Uh, so anything that you would like to add up if somebody wants to build a shop, something like that, what he yeah. should be, be oriented to, some north, just some north. Because I, from, my, from my point of view, I don't know nothing about fly shop i just went, go there and buy stuff you know, I, <laughs> i don't own a shop like you so just you know just wondering just playing the game here just yeah. wondering if what would you give it to somebody like a insight something like that uh, internet business e-commerce uh yeah. how do you expand how do you escalate the oh, business man. how do you build brand brand right very important yeah it's that's that's a tough one man because yeah the thing that I was unaware when I opened was how many plates you would have to spin, how many things you would have to keep in the air at one time. Because when we first opened times were different where it was not an Amazon buy it now, get it tomorrow day. If you wanted high quality tackle, you had to come here to see me or to go see a competitor to get that where today you can get the stuff anywhere. It's just how our world has changed. Yeah. yeah. But um, what I would say is like, we had to do everything from schools and classes. We had to educate people, teach, because teaching is like the stepping stones. Uh, you have to, you have to have a place where people can learn and you have to build that community where uh, they're going to trust you to make your purchases at that point. You know, I mean, it's about trust and developing that relationship. So teaching was number one. So schools and classes were high on our list. 20 years ago like we started that right away private casting lessons um it's awesome uh the guide business take people somewhere you know like show them what to use their skills yeah. now and uh and then thirdly you know the component of the retail thing which is its own monster and then the online store and the social media and everything else so um it's gotten more challenging now than when we started by a long shot because how media is yeah. I mean, how growing. Are you, yeah. So I have to work a lot harder today. I understand. Now. So understand, I understand a lot of place to spin at the same time. Coordinate. Oh, it's yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. I only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right, buddy. Yeah. Good, good stuff. So how about we talk a little bit about the book? Mm -hmm. When, when did you came up with the idea of a book? I understand that you're one of <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Show it to us. I, I didn't see the, the yeah. Yeah. I show it I, to everybody. I, yeah. I have props. I have props. Oh, you like that. There it is. That's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, that was another thing. My parents were like, you wrote a book. Come on. <laughs> Great. Yeah. 
awesome. Yeah. So, so, so when was the idea? When did the, the idea came up? All right, I'll, I'll tell you the story of the book. And I'm going to tell you like a couple of things I'm proud of and a couple of things that like I'm embarrassed. Let, let me just step on for, for a sec. Everybody, if you want to ask Tim anything about fly fishing itself, especially small mouth bass yeah. that we're going to be focusing on, shop, anything, just put your question there. We're going to tag it, fix it, uh, fix it up there in the comments section, and we'll, we'll, we'll address it. I will keep notes here. Okay. So Tim, with we're, we're talking there's, with each other, a, and I look, and I looked at the side. Hey Rob, I'm, 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 yeah. There's a comment in there that says, "I want to go smallmouth fishing and drink an old fashioned at Paris." These, <laughs> these are these are friends of mine. Uh, we're, we're lucky enough that during the guide season, we uh, all of our guides live off site, and we have a little uh, restaurant that we always go to every night. So okay, really okay. Cool I want to go to Paris and drink an old fashioned too. So. I just awesome. want them to know that. Awesome. But, uh, awesome. So, but, uh, but the book itself to, to kind of get to, to, to some of that. And again, yeah. you, you interrupt me if a question comes in and we'll address the question. All right. All right. That's all right. The most yep. important thing. But uh, the book came up from a, a, a friend of mine, Dave Karzinski, who Dave, this is what he does for a living. He is an author. Uh, he teaches uh, college level uh, writing. I mean, this this is what he does. He's a professional. He's written books for Orvis. And uh, he knew that through the shop here, we were the first guides and outfitters kind of in the Midwest, in all of the Midwest, to bring drift boats to these rivers and pursue smallmouth bass on a fly. We we were the first ones to do it on kind of a high level. And I understand. And at the, at pioneers, the pioneers in this area. Yeah. Kind of. I mean, there, there were so many people before us in the smallmouth bass game, like Bob Clouser uh, and Harry Murray and all these okay, amazing. Mm -hmm. But, but in this area, this was a brand new thing. We would go to fly fishing shows and there would be absolutely zero other outfitters there. None, none for smallmouth bass. It would all be trout. So it was, it was really interesting. So we had to sell that over 20 okay. years. Okay. And uh, Dave knew that at that time I had probably six or seven guides that were working for me seven days a week. So the amount of information and smallmouth knowledge that, that the shop got at that point was astounding. I mean, it was, it was a huge amount of days. It would be like you guys working on the, on the Marie, you know, coming back at night and just the collective information. Yeah. A lot know, of so, data, a lot yeah, of data. Tremendous amount of data. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I'm, so anyhow, so fast forward, he asked us to, to do this book with him, with our knowledge. Okay. And the thing that kills me, and I'm going to show you right now, and any of my guides that are watching or buddies is like, it is my name and Dave's name on the front of the cover here. And I'm very proud of that. But if you open the cover and you look in the first like couple of pages, Bart Landwer, Charlie Pate, and Nate Sippel uh, are also authors as much as I am on the book because they have they contributed just as much information. So the book came about with literally, I think this season, our shop will have done 9,000 guided smallmouth bass trips. This wow, season. wow, wow. So, so the crew of guys that helped with the information on this it's it, 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 the amount of new information is astounding. And that's why it sold so well. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I got my copy today and uh, I'm excited to, to after we, we start, uh, we finish this conversation. I'm just going to dive into it and it. learn. Yeah. Learn more about the species because it's, it's a mystery to me. It's a mystery to me. And I want to see if I can, you know, chase them here in Brazil yeah. and, Someday, hopefully, I'll, I'll I'll tag alongside with you and the, your crew to to target them for yeah. Hopefully, one day, awesome. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a lot yeah. smaller than the peacock bass on the marine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, t talking about size, uh, yeah. smallmouth bass. Yeah, what is the 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 biggest size that has been registered? Something like that. Sure. You know, yeah. Give you some perspective on like how big okay. these fish get. Now, like smallmouth bass are a really big smallmouth bass, a really big one, huge, would be a five or a six pound 
bass. That would be a gigantic smallmouth. Right. Um, but they're just known for being such great game fish because they're so strong. They have unbelievable. Out of any fish in warm water in the United States, in warm water, that's fresh water, uh, it's our hardest fighting fish. So that's, that's kind of the deal. But a lot of the smallmouth bass will be, if we look at it in inches, they will be between 14 and 19 inches with a 20 inch fish being kind of a trophy, like a okay, real okay. trophy. Okay. So. Okay. Is, is... I understand, understand. So the t temperature range that this fish mm -hmm. lives on, or I imagine that there's a, a very optimum zone of temperature sure. that he eats a yeah. lot. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's 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 interesting because our guide season should have started this month for smallmouth bass if first Saturday of May, we should have started with what we call the pre-spawn season where some of these fish will be the heaviest weight because the big females will have eggs on them. We try not to right. fish them while they're spawning at all. We stop it during the spawn because we don't want to, to, to pick on those fish at that time. Um, but we'll start catching smallmouth bass when water temperatures, I don't know what the calculation from, Fahrenheit to Celsius. I'll but... do it. I'll do it right here. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, like when the water is like 45 degrees Fahrenheit, I can catch them. 45 degrees? Yeah. Okay. Hang on a sec. Fahrenheit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go, go on. Go on. I'm just going to. But I mean, that is, Rod, that's on kind of the coldest, you know, the cold level. And okay. You can yeah. Some colder water than that. But that's kind of like where they where they kind of hang. Uh, so when we go from winter into spring, they'll start distributing throughout. But I'll tell you that the warmer the water wow. comes from, Right. 45, so cold. Yeah, yeah. 7.2 Celsius. Jungle. Yeah. <laughs> wow. The jungle. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's like during in the dual aspect of it. Like you oh, got to yeah. really work it smoothly, slowly. Oh, and then... Yeah. Very, it's, a, it's a much slower technique. Um, we use a completely different component during that time to uh, to get to those fish at that time. And we can talk more about that in a bit. But, That's very interesting, yeah. But, yeah. but kind of our prime time is smallmouth bass is interesting compared to a trout. When water temperatures warm up for trout fishing, a trout's metabolic rate kind of shuts down like it does not like the warm water. Yeah. But a smallmouth bass, as that water temperature increases or rises, they have to forage more. And they have to feed more. So they become much more aggressive feeders. So when we start to see those days that are 90 degrees Fahrenheit in, in the summer, yeah. water temperatures like 80 degrees Fahrenheit, the fish are happy. Okay, happy. okay, okay. That's awesome. So, That's very similar to, to the peacock bass. Okay. Uh, y y because we, we have peacock bass here from the southeast to the north. Sure. So 26 Celsius, which is 80 Fahrenheit, yep. it's a great temperature for most of our Brazilian hot climate species. Right. It's a great, great uh, temperature to be fishing for. Perfect. So very, very interesting. Very interesting. This but, similarity. But, yeah, but yeah. similar to peacock bass is when you see a big cold front and a big temperature swing. Yeah. Tough. Gone. Tough. Yeah. They, yeah. They don't like it. And the same, same. I noticed that fishing with you guys and fishing at different places around the world, same thing held true. Cold, yep. cold night, fish took a while to warm back up. Yep, so, yep. But feel it a lot, go down, takes a while to establish the metabolism. So, right. yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Yep, keeps them happy, kind of keeps them going. So, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Very interesting. Very interesting. So what is the season for you guys? Because you mentioned the females will spawn. Mm -hmm. and we don't fish at that period of time. So sure. what is the season for smallmouth bass? And I imagine it, it must be the same in most of the country or it. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it, it is. It is pretty similar, Rod. Um, it's, it's water temperature dependent, of course. You know, okay. th that's what we're looking at. So once we start seeing that warming temperature where I call it, and we call it in the book, we call it kind of summer disbursement. 
So early in the season, when that water temperature is really cold, uh, a lot of times I'll find a ton of smallmouth bass up by dams or uh, deeper water area because they, they kind of stayed there all winter long. They've not moved back through the winter. They're all right there. So uh, we have a description in the book where one of our guides, it was with me, it was Nate, myself, and Drew, one of my other guides, we fished pre-spawn and we put in below a dam and we just cracked them. It was, it was unbelievable. So many fish, big fish, up to 19 inches, big, heavy, smallmouth. Wow. And, uh, and it was Drew was just starting as a guide for us. And we moved down the river about, I don't know, two kilometers down the river. We did not catch a fish for the rest of the day. <laughs> Zero. Donut. <laughs> <laughs> Don't it? Yeah. It, and the reason is, is because of that summer disbursement that we talked about. Like those fish were there, but the water temperature had not warmed up where it started to push the fish into kind of their, their normal summer zone. So okay. that's, that's what we're looking at. And right now, once we get into this time of the year, like what is today, May 12th, uh, we've had pretty normal spring so far a little bit drier than average but fish have dispersed the fishing is really good i would expect with a big temperature increase in another week and a half we're going to start seeing some of our fish spawning already so that's kind of how it works and then once we get into to fast forward into the next part of the season yep. we get into say first part to middle of june okay. then the smallmouth start getting into their 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 disbursement areas where they are in their normal summer haunts we'll find some of the same resident fish in some of the same areas um they'll start acting more like uh what our guides are accustomed to for the rest of the season now then you go to the other end of the season okay. once you start getting into fall yep and the temperature starts to to, to fall and get cooler at night well, they don't respond real well to that. They kind of shut down. We have to go deeper for them. Deeper sinking, maybe. Yep. Sometimes sinking lines, intermediate lines, um, more jigging style patterns in some of the deeper holding water. Uh, they'll put the feed bag on, but we got to go after them. You know, we got yeah, yeah. We got to go. I, under, I understand. Understand. That's so, awesome. That's yeah. awesome. It's a cool. It's a cool fish. So, so clients will call and ask me, and they'll say. When do I come and fish? Is it June, July, or August? And the unfortunate part is like all of them kick ass. They're all great yeah. months. It's yeah. just a different, 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 different aspect of the fishing. Yeah. yeah. Itself. Yeah. But all great. And yeah, just come whenever you can and come mm -hmm. again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Come right. Fish. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Come to the water. Yeah. So let me just. See, we had a question here. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can. Um, Aquatic One. Tim, we, we've talked many times. Your shop and attitude is great. Wow. My question is, why is flying always marketed as a you need high-end gear to be successful? I, I, so, I can I Can, can see we address that? I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see the question, Rod. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, it's – it's the unfortunate part of our sport. And as a shop owner, I mean, I want to sell good tackle, good high-end tackle. But the truth behind it is you don't need to have the most expensive stuff. You need to have the right stuff. And the right stuff does not have to price you out of it. When a customer comes in to talk to me about equipment, my first job is to kind of feel out like what is his price range? Because if I scare him, he's yeah. not, he's not going to get into the sport or he's no. Gonna, it, so in, in the cool part right now is a lot of these companies like Reddington and some of these other companies are making really good product. That's not that expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So, I hear you. Yeah. But he's got a really good point that, unfortunately, we've done a really bad job in the fly fishing world of making it look like this elite sport. Yeah. That only the rich can do this. And yeah. I own a fly shop. I'm not rich and never will be. 
you know, but like, you don't yeah, have yeah. to have that. You don't have to have the most expensive. You can start with the budget that you have yeah. to get at least to get into the sport, right? And, and see if you. I, yeah. I I got this. I, I have this question. People come to me, newcomers into fly fishing. They ask, sure. "Hey Rod, yeah. what gear is this good? Is this bad? How much?" And it, you have to feel it. You have to feel what's your budget. Uh, right. What are you, where are you going to fish for? What species and and go from yeah. there and and try to put their first step into the sport. I think that's that's the key there. It is. Yeah, it's it's very interesting to, to yeah. get yeah. someone into the the sport yeah. by and, providing and the the, yeah. the the hard part is is like we have a fly fishing store. So when you walk in, we sell waders that are eight hundred dollars and fly rods that are a thousand dollars. But I've made it a point in my store to carry inexpensive fly lines, cheap, kind of junk, some junk. Yeah, yeah. Some waders that are not very good. And not because I want to sell them to somebody, but because I want to show them, like, if you go a little bit better, this is what you would get. I mean, you have to educate them to understand those little pieces and stuff. So, and that's, that's, that's important. So to, to answer that question, even as a fly shop owner, you call myself or a good fly shop that's honest and truthful, and we'll make sure you get the right stuff at what your budget is without killing you. That's I'd awesome. rather you get into it. Yeah. Get into the so, sport. Right. That's, that's the key point there, right? Yeah. 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 Absolutely, buddy. Um, let me just check how much time we have here because the Instagram, he closes the live after one hour. So we are about 40 minutes, but okay. I don't know what's your clock there, buddy, but I, I got time. So just let me know how much you're, you're thinking about the, the schedule so we can have. I am. I'm here for you, whatever you want. That's awesome, buddy. So let's, let's dive into some questions here. Let me see. Um, this one right here. If you have to choose fly fishing, small mouth, small bass or big mouth bass, what yeah. do you choose and why? Oh, that's an easy one. It's smallmouth bass, a hundred percent. So, not because I wrote a book on it, but uh, <laughs> no, go for a, it. Yeah, yeah. A largemouth bass in the United States. Largemouth bass is, I think, on the scale is is the number one um, chased game fish in the United States. Is a largemouth bass. That's that's the smallmouth bass is the big tournaments that go around. Uh, it is, not, but, but even it's large not part bass, of the yeah yeah. But Go even ahead. largemouth bass have these huge tournaments. And we have big tournaments for smallmouth too. But largemouth bass are far more distributed. You know, they're, I understand. They're, there's, there's more opportunity for largemouth bass. Because they have been introduced elsewhere and they adapt better than the smallmouth well, bass? Is that, is that the... Well, a smallmouth bass is kind of unique, Rod, because a largemouth bass likes slow-moving lily pads, uh, wood almost no current they, they like lakes i the understand pool. they're and more lit lethargic in that it, aspect. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah and uh but the bite is really good they explode on a popper really nicely and they do all the things that is wonderful for a game fish but um they don't fight like a smallmouth and uh, our customers enjoy fishing a river system moving down a river much like you do on the marie or some of those other rivers moving down seeing yeah. different structure yeah and fishing to it and then fighting them out of the boat with the current so uh large mouth are wonderful game fish, but a small mouth is far and away cooler fish i understand because fishing in the river t to my experience and, and personal uh taste it it's yeah. much better it's much yeah. more alive and once you introduce there's a species that match that environment better which is the small mouth bass and this this particular case that that's awesome that's great yeah. and i understand that you have is that one main river that you guys guide for the smallmouth bass it there is are more than one uh, it, yeah. it is we guide in one main river and uh th there's a comment here that i see it says smallmouth do better in colder moving water and he's a they're accurate with that they do better uh thank in you for the water. comment yeah maybe not cooler water but like moving water rock moving water. that sort of thing um but uh smallmouth bass where i am there are hundreds of rivers that are accessible uh 
and I think the fun part, Rod, about smallmouth bass and, and, and with the book and things is trout are so popular here in the United States that that's what everybody thinks of fly fishing is. Yeah. It's a trout centric world. That I think that's a, yeah, that's an issue globally. In globally. Most cases. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I mm -hmm. bet most of the guys that came and fished with you or some of our other friends and things have all had trout experience, but they have no idea. No idea. Right. Trout setting it all oh. over the place. Watch yep. it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but that, uh, you know, moving forward on that mm -hmm. in the state of Wisconsin, like our river that I guide on, and I won't mention the name of the river, but one of the rivers that we guide on primarily, if I see one other boat in seven miles in a day, I'm shocked that I saw Wow, somebody. that's now, awesome. Now, if we look at a, look, uh, give you a, an example, look at Montana, for instance, the Bighorn River. The Bighorn River might see 300 boats on a Saturday in the summer. <laughs> So, uh, so I, I have a parking cool lot. Thing. Right. Yeah, you right. do. You do. You do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'm impressed at the range of temperature which smallmouth bass can sustain yeah. themselves. Right. It's impressive. Right. Because I imagine that the in the winter time the some of the places the maybe the river freezes surface. Yeah. Yeah. And it does. Uh, wow. A lot of it freezes. So what will happen is they will still feed, but maybe a minnow a week or, you know, I mean, they're, they're barely, they shut right down. And yeah, so that's kind of how it works. Wow. That's awesome. Let's see. Uh, let me see this question here that I tagged previously. Yeah. Uh, this is from uh, one of my buddies from Brazil. Yeah. So give a hand, Zuri. Which is <laughs> hi, yeah. Tim. Uh, and feel that I feel that in Brazil the relationship science and practice in fishing is weak, but in the United States apparently more strong. Oh. You participate in the studies in science about fishing. Yeah, it, it, it is. This Thales is very interested in in directing his fishing interests. It, it, yeah, aligned with science, he's trying to make projects align with some universities. Sure. So can you give well, him in, yeah, yeah, some insight? And, yeah. I, and I, I can see the comment on there too, Rod. And absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the U.S., um, I mean, like in any country, we struggle with certain things. But Let me bring are, it back. Yeah. Yeah. But in the U.S., there are a lot of great organizations uh, that are helping put science and fishing together to come up with the correct answer or the, right. the, the correct thing. And our shop has worked with, it's called the DNR here, the Department of Natural Resources. And our shop has worked hand in hand with them on tagging programs, finding out migration patterns and things like that to help protect some of those fish. So I understand. Uh, it's, it's a big deal. It's a really it, big deal. That, that is great. Uh, uh, this is a, yeah, it's a, it's a hard topic to grasp in it Brazil is. yet. Yeah. We're trying to... I think evolve into this, but how, well, how long are these projects running for? When did they start? Maybe we can go sure. back in 50 years of time and maybe be here, Brazil right now. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, the trout projects have been running for a very long time because the trout are the most important for some of the anglers uh, that are pursuing them. So the trout projects have been in existence for, 50, 75 years already. Um, our smallmouth bass, it's really just starting to take hold in the smallmouth world right now. Because the unfortunate part with the smallmouth bass is even though it's my favorite game fish in the world to catch, um, in, the, in, in the Midwest, it's, it still does not have the respect of I what see. it should. So it does, not get, it does not get all the play. And we're pushing really hard with different organizations to get more science, more data, uh, to help them make better decisions, more educated decisions on the outcomes of those fisheries over generations. That, that's great. How do you architect some kind of pressure towards these, go uh, these public organs, what right. have you? Uh, do you have an organization of people? Yep. Is with the cities? The, how, how do you 
Well, yeah. How, just how trying do you to yeah. Assemble? Yeah. yeah. How do, how does assemble? assemble? Well, mm -hmm. we have we have a couple different groups like the Small Mouth Alliance. There's a, a club or a group that is assembled that raises funds and then can lobby different groups and things to get. Is different this locally or state wise? It or started out nationally. It, yeah. it started out locally. In yeah. each of these groups, kept expanding into different states, and then became more of a national pull. And once they get to that point, then people will listen. But it takes takes a lot to get them to listen. So it takes because, time. Well, hard work. Look, look at Brazil. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah. I've been to the market many times, and like Piaracu, like they could wipe them out if there weren't things taking yeah. <laughs> action to yeah. on some of that. Yep. Yeah. So, got close to it right crazy yeah. right so you need yeah you need that protection that's awesome mm -hmm. yeah 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 great let me see if we have one more one more tap question <laughs> this is an interesting one Ooh. how do you deal with your fishing time and your business <laughs> mm, sometimes I don't do that real well because I'd rather do more fishing time than business time. Uh, no, I mean, that's that's a really tough question. Um, I still, I think how I handle that is I still get to fish a lot myself with my family. I have a small cabin in my family and I do a lot of fishing together. Uh, but I still guide quite a bit. I guide all through the guide season in the spring and in the summer because even though I don't get to fish it's still part of who I am so I'm I'm not fishing so I can vicariously still fish through people uh I don't get to fish in the summer really at all at all zero because I'm guiding but it's good enough because I still get to fish with those people and some of my clients I fished with for 20 years so that is awesome yeah Fishing with the f family, I think it's the best one. Fishing with your family. Well, all fishing is great, but fishing with family is it's some it's unique, right? It's yeah. unique, right? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Let's move on to let me see. Well, we talked about small of bass, yep. uh, species the distribution, water conditions, yep. uh season. Mm -hmm. And what about the gear? Yeah. What do you have to bring to fish sure. for a smallmouth? Yep. It's a great question. For smallmouth bass, like the gentleman was asking earlier about expensive gear and things. I mm -hmm. would say if you had one fly rod for our smallmouth bass, a nine foot eight weight, a seven or an eight weight would be kind of ideal. Um, our currents are strong. So the eight weight is, is, is important. So a nine foot eight weight is what I would recommend. I would say in the summer, 90% of the fishing that you're doing, unless we're doing something unique with some bait fish, can be done with a floating line. And All right. uh, the leaders kind of taper down to about 10 pound, which is pretty common. So a nine foot eight weight, the reel is not that important, much like a lot of the fish in Brazil, fighting them from off the strip, you know, rather than off of the reel itself. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so, some key flies to it. Yeah, this is a really good point because this is a big part of our book. And All right. When when we first started fishing smallmouth bass, and we read all of the smallmouth books when we were first starting to get traction on the sport and truly learn about it and start to pioneer some of the techniques, this fly right here was what everybody used. This is just a Bully woolly bugger. bugger. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just like, is there something different to no, it? <laughs> no, no. All right, that's it's a woolly it, bugger. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's it. This is oh, what it was. It. That's the one, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> no, it was pretty funny. And the reason was is because uh, we, <laughs> there's a, a, a thing that says, Tim, your son is amazing caster. So yeah, yeah, so I saw happy. that one. Yeah, cool, yeah. But, but no, so, so when we first started, we basically, because there was nothing written about smallmouth other than like, Dave Whitlock had some awesome stuff and uh, Harry Murray, but it was all fairly trout centric at that time. So everything was what, and then we brought it over to bass. And the yeah. longer we started to do this, we realized very quickly that it's got like, it's its own fish. 
it's its own fish. So if we just keep trying to do a round peg into a square hole, we're not learning, we're not increasing that curve, and we're, 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 we're not giving it its all. So yeah, here's where the biggest stuff changed. So this is stuff that was really important in the book. So years ago, my cousin Bart was fishing, and we were fishing just this kind of stuff because that's what we had. Yep. And one day he came in, and there was a there was a gentleman that was fishing on the same river with his grandson, and he was fishing with a rapala. Do you know what rapalas are? Like a, it's a like a. What does it resemble? Ra rappler? But, no. Yeah, it's like it's 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 a big three treble hooks. Uh, it's, oh, okay. It's like a spinner. It's a no. Yeah. It, well, it's got a lip on it. And, you, oh, okay. Oh, water. okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like a bait that yeah. has a big lip on it and goes into. Yes. Okay. Okay. okay I got you. So there was a grandfather who was fishing and Bart watched that grandfather and that grandson fishing with gear catch like two dozen gigantic bass. So he came into the fly shop that day. This was 17 years ago. Okay. He came into the fly shop and he said, Tim, what do we have that's big? Like, really big. Now, you have to remember, I, I'm going to keep flashing back to that. <laughs> Flashback. Right. Yeah. So, so he came in. All right. And, and we had these in, our, in, in, in the shelf. This is a okay. fly called a Murdich Minnow, tied by, I don't know if it's Murdich or Murdich, but Bill okay. Murdich had this fly. Now, that fly was designed as a striper fly. It was made okay. for a different species. Okay. And the company Umqua had sold these. So Bart came in and he bought some and he went out the next day and he came in that night after his guide trip. And he was like, Timmy, you're not going to believe this. He's, you know, like, and it, it truly changed our lives because not only was the fly bigger, but the fly was neutrally buoyant. So the fly suspends over ledges, over wood. You I understand. You don't put lead on it. You don't put a cone head. You fish it as it is, or you fish it on an intermediate line or a tip. And it allows the fly to naturally move and do what it's supposed to do. So we had a secret. We were the only ones that had that secret. And we laid waste to gigantic smallmouth <laughs> for years. Wow, was, yeah, that's it, awesome. It was, it was quiet. So fast forward. The company Umpqua, are you familiar with yeah. Umpqua? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, the company Umpqua, Bruce Olson called me one day and he said, Timmy, we have 150 dozen Murdich minnows left. Do you want them for a really good deal because we're going to discontinue them? And I said, I want all of them. And I bought all of them. Well, we kept catching all these fish. And about four, three years after that, he called me back and said, what's going on with this Murdich minnow? Why does everybody <laughs> want this fly? So now, <laughs> now, now, Rod, in the Umpqua catalog, the Murdich minnow comes in two or three sizes, six colors, and has become the... Iconic. An iconic fly. And it happened at our weird little shop. Now... You look at what has happened now in the smallmouth world with some of these other guys that's coming up, and it's big articulated flies. Evolved, um, yeah. Like Blaine Chocolate, who's a good buddy of mine, you know. Like, I saw, I saw some. Yeah. Oh, that's a nice one. Yeah. Game changers, like nice game changers. It, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's variations on this theme. So like, there's been a big change, and the thing I'm proud of is like we got to be part of that. We oh, got yeah. part of Big that. Part we of saw it. happen. So it was that's super awesome. Cool. That is yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned that the fly itself, the Murdich yeah. minnow. Yeah. yeah. It's it, because of its nature that's suspended. Correct. Can go through the structures a little bit easier, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't tangle as much, I, be, I right. imagine. Yeah. Uh, do you use weed protectors in the flies? No. We don't. Like, I'll show you. Um, like some of the flies will come, you know, with a, a monofilament weed guard. Yeah. And if you're fishing lakes, uh, if you're fishing heavy cover, it's, it, it is important. It's good for that.
But what we have found on some of the top water flies, because I, if I, I, I bet you I fish top water for smallmouth 80% of the time. It's my favorite. Like, I just like it. This is one of the Umpiqua's uh, poppers, right? This or was not? actually, this one is called a boogle bug. And my friend Pierce Yates does. I'm these. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. It looks okay. similar. It's similar. Yeah. But um, I have seen with smallmouth in rivers, unfortunately, uh, fish grab the weed guard and not grab it real tight. And so yeah, they... lose the 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 hook the hook set right. The, right. the set because of the weed guard, right? I would just I... assume not have the weed guard then. Yeah, so. I got you because yeah. I, I was it, it, it reminded me the weed guards it rem, it reminds me because I tie poppers to go yeah. for wolf fish yep. oh, in sure. the weeds. Yeah, because yeah, because there's a lot of weeds in most of the places that I go fishing for the wolf fish. Yep. And it really helps, but also has the the, the cons of it, yeah. losing strikes. Yeah. Yep, yep. So in most of the time, we don't require it. But so there's right. there's been this big transition in flies. And that is, that's a big part of kind of what, what we did with the book. And in the smallmouth book, we were watching the same stuff being told to people over and over and over again. And uh, one example, Rod, I, is like like poppers here. So yep. this is kind of a standard bass popper for us, one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have time for me to tell the story of some of the smaller fly stuff, kind of. Oh yeah, overall. definitely, definitely. All, right. All so, the time in the world, buddy. Yeah. One of one of the things that we illustrate in the book that I think is one of the most important parts is. Let Let me just give the audience a little bit of the taste. Yeah. Just got yeah. mine, guys. Look at this photo. <laughs> this is amazing, man. These are these photos were done by my good friends uh, Kyle Zempel. Shot a Kyle. Yeah, Kyle. Yeah, Kyle. Kyle. Shot, yeah. He was on here just a little while ago, and that's uh, awesome. Luke. Cap Hang on a sec. We had a little bit of a disconnection. Yeah. Okay. There we there go. go. So, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah they, they're such cool fish, but. So the phenomena of just the big streamer game is a really big thing right now. And we see so many people just capitalizing on casting big giant streamers, kind of like in Brazil for you. If you, yeah. would fish a, if you would fish a whistler all the time, you would do okay. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Do okay. okay. Yeah. Um, but if you wanted to fish top water, you could still do okay, but you got to commit, you know, you yeah. have to, yeah. You have to yeah. commit. Um, so, so like we've seen like this style of flies and the game changers and all the big streamers become super, super popular. But I mean, we still fish a lot of popping bugs and every year, my biggest fish come on top water every single year, my biggest smallmouth come on top water. And so do my guides. Now I'm going to tell you a story. That's, that's one that's illustrated in the book in great detail. So we had a gentleman years ago by the name of Jack Allen, who was one of Dave Whitlock's best friends, came right. to fish with us. And Jack Allen is probably, I think when he was there, I'd have to ask my boys there, but he was probably, he had to be like 80 years old. You know what I mean? He, had, he, was, he was an older guy. He had to be 80. And he came to fish with us for 10 days the first time. Wow. I mean, you know what I mean. right? Yeah. Serious, serious. What? Stuff. So, yeah. you know, repetitive casting, difficult, you know. Um, but he had, he had a nerve disorder in one of his arms. So he could, he brought a four weight fly rod, but he put a 10 weight fly line on it. <laughs> Extra kick on it. Well, I My, mean, yeah. What, what it did for him, what it did yeah. for him is it yeah. allowed him with that nerve disorder to just pick it up and just make a big cast. It was sort kind of, of like a shooting. Yeah. Shooting uh, head or a Skagit head. It was similar. There you to, go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, um, so he, uh, so he did that and he came and fished with us. And the first year he fished with us, we'd put on a boogle bug cause he liked top water and bugging. And he said that first day, he said, Tim he's from the South. He said, Tim, that fly is too yeah. heavy. I'm like, oh my god, too heavy. <laughs> oh, like, what are we gonna do? So, so I don't, I don't, I don't have a picture of it. I, maybe I have one in the book here, but um, 
so he, I got, I got to find a picture of him because it's just, it's, it's priceless. Yeah. But, yeah. So, go for it. I'm looking okay. into it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here he is. Yeah. All right. So this is Jack. That's Jack Allen right there. All right. Okay. And this is how he worked. Like he had a, a fly box with like masking tape and like. <laughs> I'm it, watching it, a masking it, tape. It's, it's that awesome. is that? It's awesome. Yeah. So old he, school style. Rod, he pulled out of his fly box this sponge spider this that looked like something for brim or for bluegills. All right. And he said, uh, Tim, can I fish this? And I thought, oh, I have eight days of him fishing this little tiny spider. Like, we're screwed. Yeah. So I remember we, it was windy, and I went to this little back bay. And Jack threw that little spider in there, and the spider hit the water so quiet. Very dainty, very quiet. And I watched an 18-inch smallmouth come up and sip it off the top. No way. He didn't blow it up like a peacock or a largemouth where it's like, none of that. Just this baby bite. Just a baby bite. What? So, all right. So fast forward, we go down the river. And I've seen the, I've seen our smallmouth do that too, where they eat it very quiet. I've seen Hang on a sec. When, when was that? The time of the year? Do you remember? July. July? July. Okay. Yeah. Yep, it, was, yep. it was kind of that summer disbursement we talked about. Yep. But came up and, and just sipped that bug. So went down the river and it happened again. And then it happened again. And then he caught a 20 incher, which is like our trophy. That'd be like the 20 the pound peacock. Yeah. I mean, all it's right. Like, all right. Yeah. It's yeah, the, yeah. The, the holy grail. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we came back to camp and I started to talk to the guides about it. And everything we knew about smallmouth to that point was make noise, make disturbance get them aggressive, get them all jazzed up, get them to bite. You know, that was the program. Yeah. And what we found out and what was really important in the book, which we get a lot of kudos and is, is we have developed a fly now that I'm going to show you and I'll explain why it works. Charlie Pate developed this fly and it is called the old Mr. Wiggly. Okay. Old Mr. Wiggly. Okay. Okay. Old Mr. Wiggly. So now we have a new category of flies. We have poppers, we've got divers, we've got sneaky peats, and we have wigglies. And people know what wigglies are. And the reason that these work for smallmouth bass is this, and this is what we found out. When we were fishing and you threw a popper, even only this small, onto a flat where the water was shallow and the fish were hunting, but they were hunting quietly. This was too much. Okay. Spooked. Too much noise. It was too much noise. Too aggressive. They would eat, but they would passively feed, where they would come up and they would simply come up and sip this bug in because they were 100% sure it was real. And that was a game changer. That was one of those moments where a customer brought something to you, and if you didn't have your ears open and you were too arrogant to – like, Yes. No, that's not – yeah, that was because it changed how we fish. And, and now we look at like wiggly bites and like kind of how do we how do we adjust for these fish? And like it's changed everything for our game. And uh, that's, and now that's you look interesting. At, it's the finesse game. It's next level stuff. It's selective, level. selective yeah. finesse. Yeah. 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 Let me just prefer. Yeah, yeah. Let me just um, peacock bass has an aspect to it. As well, not the big ones in Marie, but yeah. smaller ones in the southeast, a little bit colder. Okay, uh, they tend to get selective during times, and small little closer minnows. Yeah, they do the trick for big ones, right. for, like for big ones for sure. uh, for the the yellow one and the blue one. Just just tiny little flies like this, Tim. Like you go fish for bonefish, this fly. Cool. Just sinking. Right. They hit it. They yeah. smash it. It's crazy. It's crazy. Well, and sometimes they won't even go for the big one because they, it, I, I don't know, because they're, they're chasing a school of small little bait fish like this and they'll yep. just go for the small one. It's crazy. It happens. And right. That's a very curious aspect. Well, to the, to the, well think yeah. about, you know, do you know Chucky at Chimani? Chucky? Yeah. I didn't meet, I didn't meet him. Yeah. Okay. Chucky's a yeah. very good friend of mine. Those guys are all good buddies of mine. 
and uh, I fished like the upper Itrasama and the upper Pluma River and some of that stuff. And up there, you have golden Dorado that are 30 pounds, massive Dorado. Massive fish, yeah. And up there, they're fishing upstream, small bait fish patterns, not the big giant stuff that we would think because the water is clearer. They're fishing waking flies. So I think every aspect of our sport has details. And if, yes. you, go, if you go into any part of the sport uh, with something that works well enough, you're going to get stuck. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Keep learning. Yeah, keep yeah. Learning. Keep learning, keep listening, testing yeah. Yeah. at times. For sure. Yes. Do not be stuck with the same idea for the the whole thing, the whole fishing trip, no. or even the same place that you go. Test, no. test, and the old, try, the old, learn. The older you get, the easier it is to get stuck in your ways. And, like, I am forcing myself as I get older to, like, just keep learning. Learn it from everybody. So Yeah, it, yeah, it, that, that's interesting. I Let me – that's very interesting because I was like in when I was guiding the Mamirawa, yeah, the Arapaimas there. They don't they yeah. don't go for the surface flies, and oh. I, I would tell the clients right away they don't don't even test it. And one day I was watching this guy's YouTube channel. He's a Brazilian. He fishes around Brazil, and he he got into a jungle and he was going for Arapaima on the surface, on the surface. And he was doing bait, bait casting because he's a bait caster. But I'm like, right. holy shit, that fish right. does that. Yeah. It's just a blaze. It's just oh. a blaze, the nuance. Did you, did, the... did you guide uh, a season at Piaracu? Were you I did, there? I did. Oh, yeah. I was there. That's a cool place, man. That's a cool place, right? Beautiful but, place. But that is, that's a perfect example of understanding and the learning because I remember I was fishing. Uh, I don't remember who I was fishing with. But, like, I remember fishing that and seeing – I have a lot of tarpon experience. I fished a lot of tarpon. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember fishing in the reserve and arapaima rolling everywhere. <laughs> it doesn't mean they're eating. No. Like, they're, just, they're just breathing. They're period. just – yeah. They're breathing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a tricky so, fish. Oh. Head so uh, one head one game. of the guides there, he's he's he said, "Hey, you gotta talk with little Tim. Say hi oh. for me, uh, Guy Guilherme. Guilherme. Oh man, That's yeah, awesome. he said he said hi to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> that is so cool. He is a very nice hey, guy. This, good, this is good the coolest friend. part. This is the coolest part of it, Rod. Like because I've been doing this for twenty years, I um, I've gotten to fish all over the world and I've got to be friends with you and. I remember getting to the Marie and getting off the float plane and a couple of the guys like, Tim, because I fished with them some other place. Yes. I mean, yes. That is great, good. right? Yeah. Hey, I got awesome. to see you again. Yes, we're going to go fishing. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. It is good. That's a really cool aspect of it. Yeah. Most of um, So you've guided for a lot of years, uh, mm -hmm. Montana. And then smallmouth bass. Yep. You, you've mentioned one, one, uh, one thing that occurred with a client that was very iconic. This yeah. one with the yeah. the little spider. Yep. Was there someone else or a moment that you tell us about was iconic for you? Well, Good memory. We've got. I mean, I think I think about. Like, I tell you one story. You know, it kind of gets off of the whole smallmouth bass, the book topic. But, like, I've gotten to fish with – I think about some of the guys I've gotten to fish with. I've gotten to fish with some of the legends of our sport. Like, I will never be a legend. I'm just like a dude that owns a fly shop. But I've gotten to guide – like, Dave Whitlock, Dave and Emily are good friends of mine. I talk to them regularly, and they're close friends. Um, That's awesome. I've had, I've had uh, the luxury of getting to guide the great Lefty Cray a number of times. And uh, wow, lefty, yeah, lefty cray in the front of your boat is uh, is a pretty astounding thing. And uh, I'll tell you one quick story about yes. lefty that I don't think I've ever told anybody before. Well, my guides know of it, but 
uh, as, as those of you in the fly fishing world know, Lefty has passed away and left a giant hole because he will be kind of the end all in the United States as the, the guy in the fly fishing world. And um, I remember this was years ago, he was fishing with us and a good friend of mine, Jim Grace, and Lefty was here and his doctor was here and they had just changed some of Lefty's medications around. There's Dave Galatly. That is my good buddy, Dave, just signed in. He is my sage rep and awesome all around. Hey, Dave. Dave how's it going? Thanks so, for coming. Yeah. But um, so he was in my boat and they had changed some of his medication and Lefty had a bad heart. And we had fished for a day. And I remember I was Nate was guiding in the other boat and we got down to this island and uh, Lefty told me he, he calls me Timmy. He's like, hey, Timmy, I'm not I'm feeling dizzy. I'm just feeling dizzy. I've got to sit down. But Lefty was probably 90 years old when this happened. Wow. And uh, so his doctor came over and he said, Lefty, you're having a heart arrhythmia right now, which is bad. Um, and he told me, he said, we have to find a place for him to lay down. And I said, we're in the middle of nowhere. There's no place to lay him down. So he said, we've got to row out. I didn't have a motor on my boat. I have a drift boat. So I pulled my cooler aside and here's Lefty Cray laying down in the front of my boat on all of my life jackets to keep him comfortable. And he's kind of going in and out of consciousness because wow. like, and yeah, I'm, thinking, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking to myself, Rod, I am going to kill the most <laughs> famous. <laughs> oh no, not a good story. <laughs> This is not what you want to be known for. You know, this is not. <laughs> no, that's but supposed still, to happen. But yeah. like long story short, Lefty would come in and out of consciousness and he'd be like, Timmy, how far are we? I'm like, Lefty, only 15 more minutes. He'd be like, God damn it. You told me that 45 minutes ago. <laughs> and, and then he'd go back. But we got him back out and we got him safe. But I just remember thinking back on that and like, I mean, it, it, it's, it's so some of the stuff in guiding is just like yeah. it, it's different it's, it's, it, it's incredible. Yeah. so yeah yeah i miss i miss the amazon i hope i can get back there and guide again and you in some way yes i love it, it yeah it's, you're good yeah. i fish with you you're thank, damn good so thank you buddy yeah i yeah. really appreciate that yeah thank you coming from you yeah, yeah it's very i'm honored by it oh it was fun yeah it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun <laughs> uh let's see you guys have any questions for tim send them away uh let's go let's move on to the next topic um yeah. so i think we covered this one if you go back in time would you give yourself an advice something you of today to your younger younger version would you give you an, a piece of advice maybe? don't op don't open a fly shop <laughs> no <Nah. laughs> no i mean like i i i've i've learned i've learned a, a bunch uh a, a bunch rod and i think the piece of advice and i've tried to follow it the best i can through all of this and it's worked surround yourself with good people the best people keep your arrogance out of it the best that you can and uh understand there's always people who are better at what you're doing than you're doing and and most of it's just a head game so i mean i think it's just really about it's 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 really just about you know keeping keeping the course doing your own thing developing your own thing don't worry about what everybody else is doing or what's the cool kid doing i mean that's, that's it that's a great piece of advice yeah so yeah but uh that's that's kind of how all of that works and other than that, I wouldn't change a thing. Like, I love what I do. I still absolutely love what I do. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah I was but, talking to my brother today, and he, he's, he's going through a phase that he's selecting a new job. And he's like, hey, this really good stuff came in. I'm like, don't do it if it's just for the money. <laughs> That's a great don't, piece of advice. Don't right, do right. it. Yeah. Do what you want to do, like, that you really like. Yeah. And – no, yeah, you, you have to do yeah. what you like. And like, this is the only thing I'm really good at. I mean, and I'm, 
Maybe that I'm is great even... because it's something that you really like and you're really good at it. I still like it, and but in, in, and maybe it's not that I'm really. I'll tell you what I've got. The the magic, the the key to my success in my business is the guides that work for me. I've been around a lot of guide groups in my lifetime, and I will tell you, I have got ten guides that work for me, and I'll tell you, I've got Charlie, Nate, Bart, Michael. Drew, Gavin, Gabe, Todd, AJ. I can name them all because every one of them are my best friends. And, and it's a different situation because nobody is trying to outdo the next guy. This everybody, is awesome. Everybody works for the team. And the team Did is tight lines. And that's hard to find. That's a good jump in right there. What is a key element on developing such a team? Because I imagine, Tim, I only imagine you're a very good leader. To assemble a team like that, to assemble <laughs> a team like that, it's a challenge. It's a very, very uh, big challenge. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what we've, what, here, here has been our key to success, and this is what it is. So you can hire guides who have been all over the world and fished everywhere and have their own program and who have, you know, all of the skill sets. I've got a couple of guides that work like, okay, so Bart guided in Colorado. A couple of my guides guided in Alaska. Um, but most of my guides, my number two guide, Nate, had never guided a day in his life when I hired him to guide for me. And I'll tell you, here's the key to it. The key is you hire a guide who's a good person, who is super fishy, super, super, super fishy. And when Nate came into my shop, like he was dripping with fishiness. Like that guy, we knew it. Passion on it. Uh, but he was a good person and he would be good with clients and he was could be good. There is no room in the fly fishing or guiding business for a guy who yells at customers, who we, we call it our filter, like that filter that, the stuff that you hear in your head that you want to say out loud, but you shouldn't. And that's the difference is, is having that filter with a guide who, I mean, so, so long story yeah. short, how did I develop my team? I found the best guys that I possibly could with the best demeanor who were super fishy and taught them. And that's how it worked. So that's awesome. And, uh, Because I, I imagine that I, I, I don't know about this, the story of the team itself, yeah. but hiring and firing, did you have to fire a lot of people to get oh. to build this group? You know, I, I, I've, I've, I've got to find something here. I'm sorry. I'm looking down. I'm just, looking that's, that's okay. And if this I, is, a... I, I've never, I've never, because of our guides are independent contractors and they're not employees. I, I, I've never fired anybody because legally I can't really fire somebody. Um, I understand. But, I understand. But I have, I have had one guide that I did have to part ways with just because even though he's a great dude and a great friend of mine, he had a little harder time, um, you know, with that filter that we talked about. I understand. And over yeah. time and maturity, that's all changed. So, yeah. Uh, And, I but, understand I, but, that too. Yeah. but but I think the most important part is our guides helped build the rest of the group. You know, uh, our guides taught the new guides. We have breakfast together every single day. And at breakfast, I've watched my guides draw maps for the other guides on a specific spot. Like, you should be here. And I've never been part of a guide team where that was the case. And every I understand. one of my guides does that. So that is great. I had the fortune to share that with my buddies back in Marie and Mamirawa. That I that could, is awesome. I, I, I could I could I could see that at the Marie. Um, typically, I'm a good read on that because I've been around it so often. And there's been a couple of camps where you could you could see like some friction or something. But like at the Marie when I was there with our group, uh, I didn't see that. You know, I mean, I, I felt uh, awesome Team. group of dudes. That's awesome, great. Awesome That's group great. of dudes. 
And I imagine you can grasp something like that, just like (laughs) a glimpse of an eye. (laughs) I I can. can. Yeah, I can imagine that. (laughs) And I'll tell you one thing that's been pretty cool, Rod. Like over over the years, it's been a lot of fun for me has been uh, the fact that every time I go to one of these places um, and I'm with a bunch of guides like yourself, for some reason I get sucked right in and I like you guys have befriended me like immediately. And I don't know, I'm not that nice of a guy. Like, but, Oh, you but, are, uh, you are, you are. No, but, but, but I think what ends up happening is I think that we all are the same person and you can identify that. Yes. So like, yes. I remember at the Marie, like you guys staying up too late and drinking a bunch of beers with me and we were all BSing and like, like, I know you got to work the next day. Like, ah, uh, you could do that every night with clients, but like, and, and the we're here, we're happened. here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and for the, the uh, Tim, Tim's guides crew, uh, when we were side to side in the Marie, I was guiding him. I yeah. remember this, like it was yesterday. You said, man, I wish I could bring my, my group here, my buddies, my guides yes. here. Yes. This is, would be so awesome. Yes. And, and I, th- that, that's how much they mean to you. This is really cool, man. A good team, a good team, good friends. I'm, that's I'm, that's I'm, special. I'm it, and sometimes I don't show them that all the time because, I mean, it's like the season. But, like, they all know it. And throughout the rest of the season, there's a brotherhood. So it's, it's pretty cool. That's but, fantastic. Yeah. My mom sent a message. Great hat. Use one like this, Rodrigo. <laughs> I will send you one. Tell your mother to send you one. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. That's oh, boy. Yeah. Tim, what's your favorite Y axis fly? Is that what it's called? Y axis yeah. fly? What, what the question is, is like in the book, we break down like an X axis and we break down a Y axis. And unfortunately, right. in the book, we have we have one typo in the book. So I apologize, guys, the typo in the book, how they're mixed up. Because the x-axis is the curved river in the book, and the y-axis is straight. It's it's actually flip-flopped. So the, the y-axis, where the river makes a lot of bends and things like that, those fish are usually faster feeders. Uh, All right. Meaning um, they, they have to take the bait quicker. You know, I mean... Just because Y axis is like a fast moving water in the curves. Well, is, it, no. is that what it is? No. So, so I'm going to show you. Oh, I it, just saw it. it I just it, saw it in the book. Unfortunately, the, the diagrams are mixed up. Like this says Y axis. I just saw it. That's awesome. And the X axis. <laughs> I'm super but, excited about the book. But, yeah. but, but, but they're mixed up. They're mixed up. So oh, oh, unfortunately, okay. that was a typo. So the I, X see, axis I see that. that. You can see yeah. where it's all curved like that yeah. would be the Y axis to answer your question. In, in a spot like that, like some of those bigger bait fish patterns and like big diving frogs and intermediate lines, it's the best for that. Now, when we look at some of those straighter rivers with some of the bigger flats on them, shallower water, that's where some of our finesse game comes in because they have a chance to be up on the really? flats. Yeah, they can see, they can look around. So it's a great question. And I apologize for the mix up in the book, but it's a great question. Thank you question. for the question. Yeah, excellent. TN River Smouth. Tennessee River Smallmouth. Oh, oh okay. So, awesome. But um, yeah, th- this is awesome. Uh, and um, the book's not expensive at all for you know, uh, Americans. So if you don't have the book, I highly Tennessee recommend Small everybody Mall. to, to go you for it. it back. Gotta give him a thumbs up. Thank you guys for, yeah. <laughs> awesome, buddy. Thank you for sending the question. So Tim, what is yeah. the link to go for the, I'm going to type it down. Yeah. Your shop. Yeah. And check it out. Check all the products. Absolutely. Get in touch like with our, you our, and our order website, the book. The website is www tightlinesflyshop.com so it's t-i-g-h-t-l-i-n-e-s-f-l-y-s-h-o-p.com and that is our online store and it has our book and everything on there and all things smallmouth and everything in between so thank you Rod. Correct. Good. check it out that's, yep it's perfect um and uh you can get our smallmouth book on that and most of the patterns and things that we discussed and the unfortunate part about it in 
we're talking about doing it as a group with our guides is a zoom meeting and breaking down every one of the chapters of the book. Uh, That's with awesome. All of, with all of the authors in the book. So uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of details and the book is in its third printing right now, which I'm pretty excited about. So that's yeah, pretty cool. It's been great. That's Dave pretty did cool. A great job with it. So for everybody, for all the Brazilian listeners, you can get this in the Amazon. So mm -hmm. just type Amazon.com.br and go for small mouth altogether. Everybody that has a question about it, just DM me afterwards. I'll send you the link. But you can buy in the digital version in Kindle. So I'm just looking at it right now. You can read it from your laptop, uh, desktop, iPhone, whatever phone that you're using. So this is great, man. A great, It's great awesome. book. A lot of information that I'm going to dive into you because I want to challenge this species. I'm going to yeah. get them. <laughs> <laughs> you just come over and fish with us, Rod. Yeah, I have to do it. I have to do it. I'm going to so. save some money and then I'll go for hey, it. I, yeah. I, I, I see you had Everton on from Recife Tarpon. Yes, I did. Everton. Did, he guided you also, right? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. Everton. Look. That's awesome from Ken Jam, right? Absolutely. You've so been Everton, there. You've been there. Ever no, Everton gave me that. That that's awesome. That's from the so, Kaiapa tribe. Yeah, that's yeah. really that's really cool, man. He oh. was he was here. He was here. He yeah. attended the the live for a bit. I don't oh, know if nice. he's still there. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Great yeah. dude. Great dude. Great dude. Um, so for everybody that listened to us and from people that are going to listen, we're gonna put this on YouTube. We're gonna put this in Spotify, Deezer. There is the website of the fly fishing cast this is the second episode and the first guest tim i'm honored by your presence thank you very much <laughs> rod you're joining awesome, no man you're awesome really thank you thank you very much My do you have pleasure. one one extra message for the audience something that you want to say to the listeners you know I, I, I'm going to say this because I've been kind of following you and what you're doing with uh, like your teaching and, uh, you know, trying to get people involved in, in the sport. Because I've been watching that. I've been watching your progress. Cool. And the, the, the question that we got earlier about why is fly fishing expensive? Why does it have to be that? I think something that's very important to tell all of the listeners, not just about the book and everything else, is like, I just – all of us just want all of you to fly fish. Like, yeah, that's it. I mean, it's the message is simple. Like I don't need to spend you to, to get you to buy expensive tackle. I want, uh, you know, I want <laughs> show your tooth. <laughs> yeah, it's, big, it's the, it's the, you've seen that. You've seen the, the, the big Caymans in the Maduro. Yeah. And I yeah. got to do if she wants me to shoot. He has been there, mom. He has fished there. He has seen it. Okay. I love your yes. mom. I love your mom. <laughs> tell your mom I love your mom. All right. I'll tell you Portuguese, but she you got mom. you. She got you. Yeah, she got you. Got it. <laughs> uh, but, but to just kind of circle back on that, like, you know, like you're trying to teach, is it your brother-in-law or your brother to fish or who, who my are you brother, teaching? My brother, my brother. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I, I just want people to learn how to fish. I need their business because that's what keeps yes. us all alive. Yes. But like the long and short and the truth of like all of this and what we do is like, I do it because I, I like it and I love it and the people yeah. and, and everything in between. So it's, uh, I, I think that's what I could say. Like everybody who's out there for the right reason is trying to teach you and uh, just go to those people, the right people. That's awesome, buddy. Thank you very much for joining, you, Rod. I sharing, your sharing your knowledge, and really, thank you, buddy. Thank you a lot. The pleasure was all mine. This is a lot of fun. All right, tight lines, tight lines, brother. <laughs> thank you guys for for showing up. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Good night. Good night.